Hello, and welcome to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. The show today is presented to you by Gasowitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether through your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news, pictures, and tips, go to our new website at gasowitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at a state dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts are Adam Gaslowitz and Craig Frankel. And today we're talking about transitioning the family business, valuation and restructuring tips to maximize results. And now it's time to introduce our guests. We're pleased to have with us today Gina Miller, Consulting and Advisory Services Director at Bennett Thrasher, and Brian Corbett, Managing Partner at CCG Advisors. And before we begin, let me at least, uh, let me have each of you tell our audience a little bit about your background. Why don't you start, Gina? Sure. My name is Gina Miller. I am with Bennett Thrasher. It is a top 100 accounting firm in the nation. It is a full-service accounting firm. I'm director of disputes, valuations, and forensics, spending most of my time on valuation work, either for uh, tax purposes or uh, transactions. Brian? Uh, Founder and managing partner of CCG Advisors. We're a Midtown Atlanta-based boutique investment banking firm, and we specialize in working with family businesses in the areas of succession, transition, and sale. All right. All right. Well, let's let's start with that then. Uh, why don't you talk about what um, scenarios generally lead to uh, transition or business succession? Um, there are many reasons. Sometimes it could be the health of a business owner. Um, many other times it'll be because the market is peaking, high valuations. Um, And a lot of times it revolves around the family, right? The family and business become somewhat interchangeable, and we have fathers and sons and daughters and trying to figure out what they're going to do with the business and who's going to stay in, who's going to run it, and and whether they should sell. All right. Gina, the same? Sure, it is. Also, the um, sometimes it's part of a tax planning situation. So they're looking to get the value out of the current owners and into possibly the next generation. When, when you say tax, what do you mean when they get into the next generation? Are you talking about avoiding estate taxes or something else? Or minimizing tax, estate taxes by gifting, um, entering into some sort of a gifting plan where you're moving the interest to the next generation. Okay, so I'm hearing kind of two kind of basic reasons. One is to transition to another generation, maximizing or minimizing taxes. And the other is transitioning, whether it be to another generation or another uh, person f- to take advantage of whatever is necessary for the transition. Correct. Yes. Okay. Or sell to a completely independent third party just to maximize the value and, and retire. Yeah, That's I right. mean, many times we find these days that kids are not coming into the business or they can't or don't want to run the family business. And so most of our clients have had their companies for decades and at some point they want to get their chips off the table. So natural to look for a third party rather than family. Yeah. Let's, let's follow up on that. You know, historically, when I was growing up and ought to, as my children say, uh, a lot of kids went into the family business. And you see lots of multi-generation. I'm not seeing that as much in my clients or my friends. How, how often now are small businesses transitioning to families kind of in your, in your experience or is it now more going to third parties? Um, I'll take that one. The, the stats really haven't changed. I've been in the business for 25 years, and historically, 33% of family-held businesses will transfer from first generation to second, and 13% will get to third generation. So there are truly fewer and fewer family businesses that will go three, four, five generations. And and the other 75% that don't transition, are they Your going out of business? math is very <laughs> odd. <laughs> are, are they going out of, uh, yeah, something like that. Are they, going, are they going out of business? Are they selling to uh, uh, an independent third party? Or Typically, they're being sold. Okay. Typically, they're being sold. Folks, I think, have, you know, they work a lot of years. They've loved what they've done, but they want to get some chips off the table, retire, you know, de-risk, um, diversify their net worth. Uh, of those that are transitioning to family, um, how many of those are successful? In other words, does the transition work, or is it a it never gets to the third generation, it drops down to 13% because the business doesn't succeed in the next generation? Correct. So those are the stats. The 33 and the 13% are those that successfully transition to second and third generation. Um, and I know Gina and I have chatted before about a lot lack of planning and other reasons why they fail. So Ooh. now that's where we're going, lack of <laughs> planning. So tell tell our listeners... And Gina, we can start with you. Tell our listeners when you should start thinking about this so that you can be in that 33% if it goes to family 
or whatever the percentage is for success for sale if it goes to a third party? When should we start? Sure. So as soon as possible, as soon as you have the thought. You know, when they talk about uh, you start a new job, that's the day you should update your resume. <laughs> Similarly. <laughs> I'm hoping all the employees at Gaswitch Frank no are not cynics here. <laughs> but similarly, you, you know, you're, you start a business, you need to think about what your exit strategy is. And so, but typically people are coming to, you know, they want to make a decision and they want to make it now. But I, I've heard about three years gives you a chance to take all those necessary steps to get your business ready to be sold. So is, is valuation the first step or? Well, valuation is a very important step, um, certainly because it might identify areas where there are certain risks. And those risks are what you want to minimize so that when you do put your business on the market, it can gain, get the value that you expect. When you say risk, what, what, what types of things are you talking about? Well, certainly there are a lot of risks with business, but certain risks uh, really would jump out to a potential buyer. For instance, if you have a lot of customer concentration, you may or may not be able to adjust that. You may, you, some businesses really do have one major customer, but if you can spread that out over multiple customers, you're gonna mit mitigate that risk a bit. Are there other ways, to use that as an example, other ways to, if you've got a, a with single customer that's important, are there ways to smooth the trail for that customer or at least enhance the relationship so that they would stay with the company or those other types of things you'd look at? Well, you'd certainly have to try to find a way to transition that relationship if you're going to transition the ownership. So if I, as a business owner, have a very strong relationship with this client, that may be difficult to transfer. Does that affect the value? Oh, it definitely would. <laughs> yeah, from a third-party standpoint, there's going to be a significant discount if you have customer concentration. I mean, one customer may be an unsaleable business. Normally, we find buyers start to get a little bit concerned when a single customer represents north of 20 to 25% of annual revenue. So a diversity in customer and, and revenue is very important. Although even if you have a diverse customer base, you still got to somehow transition that to either a new owner or, or the next generation of family members, right? Correct. And you, some of the things you can do from a planning process is making sure that you have current contracts. Some folks are like, well, we've been working for you know, ABC Corp for 25 years and we just never renew the contract and that doesn't give a buyer warm and fuzzy. So having a current contract that's signed that reflects the current economics, very important. Um, ideally, you'll have a good accounting firm that can help or a good CFO and systems where you can track revenue by customer because most buyers are gonna wanna go back at least three years historically. So you wanna be able to explain to them very clearly where the revenues come from and why they'll be able to be transferred post-closing. Okay, so where, where does the process start? Somebody comes to, to either of you and says, I'm thinking about selling my business or I'm thinking about uh, transferring the business to my, my kids one of these days. Um, wh wh where does the process begin? So when, when they come to us, they've either talked to their tax accountants and they've talked about transitioning the company to a next generation or they've actually received an offer for the company and they're like, I just received this offer. I have no idea if this is a, a good offer. And so we start with evaluation. Okay. And, and Brian, let me let me switch to you. If someone comes to you and say, I'd like to transition my business, they're looking, as Gina says, three to five years out. Mm -hmm. Do they typically know that they wanted to go to family or is this something they need to be thinking about? You know, who should it go to? I mean, is that the first question they're going to ask you? Yeah, I mean, one of the first questions we would ask a business owner when he comes to see us, um, hopefully one to three years in advance <laughs> of a transaction, um, would be, you know, how long have you had the company? What are your hopes and desires? Are you looking to get your equity out of the business? Do we need to create some type of transaction to do that? Are there family members in the business? Are they truly capable of running it, right? Not all parents can look at their children honestly and, and determine whether they're truly capable of running a large-scale business. Or well, they can they can do it, they just won't say it out loud. Correct, yeah. correct. So there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of psychology that goes along with the numbers, but I would also say to Gina's point, we start with valuation because if a client says, I'd like to transition or sell my business, the first thing we want to do is figure out, does the client have a reality check on what that business is worth? Many I, business owners do not. I, I would imagine that most don't. When we're talking about family, is, 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 this, is, is an issue even if you have a family member who's ready to, to take over and that you have confidence in? Oftentimes, it's not all family members. How do you deal with the fact that there may be some family members in the business, and there may be some family members who, though they're going to get, quote unquote, their inheritance, aren't going to be in the business? Sure, and, and you see parents take that, tackle that differently. Um, go back to more of an estate planning concept of equalization. Okay, so one child of, say, three is in the business and actively running. The other two are not. 
Um, big challenge, right? I mean, I think involving kids in a business or giving them stock in a business that they're not active in, we've seen lots of challenges with that over time. Well, that's that's the nature of our <clears throat> business when the disputes rise. So I'm, I'm really talking about how you can set it up and to avoid that if that's an issue. Yeah, we, we, we try to have the parents equalize through other assets. Um, sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it's not. Typically for a family business, the business itself can represent 80, 85, 90 percent of the net worth of the family. Um, typically a longstanding business may own the real estate that they operate out of. So there's another asset, um, investment accounts, and simply through good succession and estate planning, they could also equalize via life insurance. Um, so the business transfers at the death of the parents to the child who needs to run it, and the cash goes to the heir so that they are equalized in value. Is, is that part of the planning process, the, the one to three years that you're hoping to have? We'd like to see that. I mean, I think a, a good team would be, you know, certainly accounting advisors, uh, legal counsel, and investment bankers so that you can kind of get a holistic approach to, okay, you've got a family, you've got a business, you've got a lot of intertwined issues here. Um, you know, a, again, three years out, we can start dealing with those issues. If we're having to deal with that as we're going to market, not ideal. Let, okay. Let's take a really easy step back. You, you referred to three sets of advisors, and one was an investment advisor for, or I mean, investment banker, I'm sorry. For most businesses, they've never used an investment banker. What, what, what do you mean by that? No, you're right. So that's what we do, right? So we're taking people through um, capital markets transaction, a sale of the business, a recapitalization of the business, potentially an ESOP. Um, you're right. Most folks will have an accounting firm or an accountant that they work with annually. They'll have a law firm you know, that they work with on, regular, on a regular basis. An investment banker is, is usually not you know, in, in the picture until it's time to go to market. And let's be even more simple. We're now talking about an outside funding source for someone to be figuring out how this could be funded. Correct. Somebody that helps them figure out what their business is worth in conjunction with a valuation professional like Gina um, talks about their different alternatives. There are numerous alternatives for sale, transition, et cetera, and then actually taking the company to market when it's time to sell. So, so what happens if someone comes to you and says, I want to sell my business. I think it's worth $25 million. You do a valuation. It's worth $18 million. We, it, they're disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But from our standpoint, it's all about educating them. You know, what is it that creates value in your company? And it could be if their expectations are very different than the valuation itself that they just need more time. Then we can go back to, you know, what are the risks that are causing the lower valuation and see if we can kind of correct those. And, how, and, and tell me what types of things you could do to, to correct it, to increase value during that time period. Sure. So we had talked about maybe reducing your customer risk, but also let's clean up the books. Let's make sure that your financial records are in good shape. And let's, let's warn our, our listeners, when we say clean up, we don't mean change them and <laughs> falsify them. Absolutely we mean not. make them cleaner and better mm -hmm. and easier to use. That's right. If you're running expenses through that may not be company related, let's see about moving those out or at least identifying what those are so that in evaluation, those can be recognized separately. Yeah, and, and same conversation, right? There's no sense going to market and having people spend a lot of time, money, and emotion if there's a disconnect on a, you know, say a $25 million expectation and an $18 million reality. So I agree with Gina. Oftentimes we try to explain, here's why your business is actually worth all of $18 million, not a small sum of money, but here's why it's not quite worth 25 yet. And again, whether that's customer concentration, you know, uh, books and records that aren't as clean as they should be, you know, perhaps they need to tie in key employees uh, with some type of, uh, you know, incentive plan, deferred compensation plan, non-compete. Um, there's a lot, a lot of things that a closely held business needs to consider. And again, trying to, trying to do that really through the eyes of the buyer. You know, these folks have run these businesses normally for a long, long time. And some, sometimes can lose the forest for the trees. We but, try to bring them the, the opinion and, but, and but viewpoint some, of a buyer. But there's some things that can be done other than just growing the business. Your business is not big enough to be worth 25. There's some things that can be done that are uh, sort of structural that would allow the valuation to change. And since you're doing the valuation, you know, there are things you can say, well, it, it was, we valued it at a lower rate because of this issue or that issue that you can fix, right? That's correct. And then to Brian's point, you know, if, if the person that owns the business is the key management to the business, you have got to put, bring them in in some sort of an agreement that they may stay on to help transition the business. Um, that provides a, a lot of risk for buyers. You're listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts today, Adam Gastelowitz and Craig Frankel, with the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gastelowitz Frankel. Today, we're talking with Gina Miller and Brian Corbett about transitioning the family business, valuation and restructuring tips to maximize results. 
Let, let's let's talk about the key person. Is it is it relatively common for closely held companies, in addition to the matriarch or patriarch or owner, to have a key employee? We often find that there is yes. And you, what are some of the options that that you, as an, an advisor, getting someone ready to sell the business, can do to to use that key employee? There's kind of two sides to 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 get a comfort level with that key employee to stay or and and the other level to make that key employee attractive or the business attractive to whoever the buyer is what can the, the owner do with your advice you know I, I would say oftentimes we have them enter into some type of incentive plan more often i would say our preference is a non-qualified option so that they're not actually giving shares and you guys are in the dispute business and know better than i um you know closely you know minor- minority shareholders and closely held businesses can lead to many issues many issues yes so, so we like to find uh where an owner will say hey i'm going to grow this business at some point we may sell you are key to this business so i may want to have a valuation done today kind of set the bar for what the business is worth today and if you stick around and help us run and grow this company we can pay you a portion of the increased value Value from this time until the time of sale, oftentimes called a, um, a SAR plan, stock appreciation right, or other deferred comp type plans. Is the process you go through different whether you're dealing with a uh, sale to a third party versus a uh, transition from one generation to the next? Yeah, I, I think a very different process, right? I think if you're transitioning the business, the idea is to, to minimize taxes, as Gina said. So you're going to look at valuations and and I'll let her talk more about gifting and and discounting and all those types of things in valuations. When you're going to sell, you're you're trying to maximize value, right? You want that buyer to pay you as much as humanly possible, you know, for that company. Well, let's talk about how you kind of minimize for um, transfer tax purposes. What do you do for the intra-family transfer? What are some of the ways that you can do that? Right. So the IRS certainly recognizes certain discounts, uh, minority interest discounts or or we call lack of control discounts where if it's a actual minority interest being transferred there's a discount associated with that the flip side of that is there's a premium if you have control right you can liquidate you can cause distributions things like that without that there's a discount you'd also have a discount for lack of marketability you know closely held fam family run businesses are very hard to sell so it takes a significant amount of time before you can get uh, your interest converted to cash so there's a discount for that. There may be other discounts too. So you could that's, when, that's when you're trying to get the value as low as possible so that when you transfer it, the transferor doesn't have a whole lot of tax consequence. Right, it usually minimizes their tax consequences. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, if you want to do an intra-family transfer, you may change or, or clean up the structure to try to get it into uh, an entity like an LLC or limited partnership that has minority ownership and things like that. Brian, let's ask the question in the inverse. If you're trying to sell to a third party, do you try to unring those bells? No, I, I actually, it, a proper plan would combine the best of both, right? You're trying to maximize the value in the eyes of the buyer, but at the same time, you still want to minimize your taxes. So ideally, again, with this prior planning, come in, have a business valuation done, establish minority discounts before you go to market, before you start getting offers in writing that establish what the real fair market is, give those gifts to trust, partnerships, what have you, so that when you sell, a significant portion of that asset is already in trust at a lower value. That's why we say one to three years in advance, because if you come in and there's already an offer on the table, as Gina said, it's going to be really hard to get that business owner to be able to focus on doing all this gifting and planning. At that point, he just wants to sell the business. Do, do you work with the companies as that process is happening? I mean, do you do you, do you actually <laughs> physically walk them through these steps? We we do. We we talk about what are you trying to accomplish. And at the end of the day, right? Whether you're talking about the you know the eighteen or twenty five million dollar example, well, that's the gross. That's the enterprise value. That's not what you put in your pocket, and that's what they really need to know. So we try to say, okay, if the be- business sold between eighteen and twenty five million dollars, you're going to have fees. You're going to have taxes. So we try to help them figure what they're actually going to net, and that's a good time to have that discussion of, hey, that's you. What about your kids and grandkids? This planning and gifting can leverage the benefit of this transaction for generations but you also may have situations where you know employees don't have non-competes and you may want to and that uh, i assume would affect the value if it's easy for uh, an employee to leave and take a lot of the business with them is that you know the kind of structuring that you'll do in this in this run-up period to sale 
It, it can, again, if you can identify key folks other than matriarch, patriarch, et cetera, try to come up with, you know, if you're going to ask them for something, right, if you're going to ask them to sign a non-compete or a non-solicitation of customers, that might be the right time to give them that carrot of the incentive plan. So it's like, hey, you are a key person. I want to incense you to stick around and grow the business. But at the same time, you need to understand that, you know, the ultimate buyer is not going to want to have you walk across the street and start taking away customers right after closing. So it's just, it's a good way to give a little, get a little, and do things that will be helpful in, in the transaction. For employees, there's a, I hear a lot of buzz from my clients and whatnot. For employees, is it better to have a non-compete or to have a non-solicit of my customers or, 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 or employees, or is there some variation that works best? Yes, yeah, so from the, well, I guess you got two different, uh, Viewpoints, right? From the employee standpoint, he'd prefer to have neither, right? I just yeah, want to get paid. We're to not do a good job. But I'm going to assume. <laughs> I'm going to assume that we want to. I mean, I, the tension I see is with non competes, they become lots. Oftentimes, there's fights, but it makes it unattractive, and you don't get loyal employees. Correct. On the other hand, with nothing, you may have more loyal employees. A non solicit is so much easier to enforce, and seems, at least from the employee's perspective, to be somewhat fairer. And so I'm really asking, how do you get both the, the, the end goals? You get the employee to want to stay, give them the incentive that isn't always money, but still makes it attractive to the buyer. Correct. And in a lot of states, the non-competes really don't even hold up. They're not enforceable. Several states, I mean, California being one, almost unenforceable. The non-solicit, much more fair to your point and much more enforceable. It's like, hey, you can leave and you can stay in the industry. You just can't call on our customers and you can't take any of our employees for some period of time. So I think the non-solicit is, is a more reasonable um, approach for, for both seller and employee. And the lack of that would affect value? It, it can. Absolutely. I mean, if they, if they control significant parts of the operations or customer relationships. Mm -hmm. And in addition, and we haven't really spoken about it, but we like to see depth of management. We don't like to see one person in charge of, and running the whole business. So we're looking for you know top management, which may be the owners, but then a secondary layer of management. Mm -hmm really reduces the risks when you're transferring company. And that, that would, I assume, apply mostly if you're selling to a third party, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. in, in terms of how well the companies run, it would apply intra-family as well, because a lot of people have family members who are running key aspects of a company but not doing it particularly well. That's but, right. But, but if you're selling, having a depth of management is going to be a key factor in, in being able to transition the business to another completely independent party, right? I believe it's a key factor. It's certainly something we consider when we value the company because having management rest with just one or two people is just a lot of risk. With family-owned, closely held businesses, how many of them have depth of management? <laughs> None of them. <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's rare, but it actually just depends upon the size of the business. You know, the larger the size, the more your expectation would be that they would have some depth of management. Let me invert it. So you now you have depth of management. Um, do you is it is it normal to have some tension between the family own, family member the child um, versus the the key employee the CFO the COO or is that something that works out normally pretty well? Well, I think that that transition to maybe the next generation has to be handled very carefully when it's a family member. So dad transfers to son, but yet you have depth of management people that have been in the business longer than the son. I think you have to transition very carefully so that that son of the owner has the respect of the rest of the management. How do you handle that, Brian? Yeah, I agree, right? If, if the kid started in the stock room and he's worked his way up through summers and college breaks and now he's got a degree and he's going to come in, I mean, he doesn't need to come in as the chief operating officer, right? I mean, that's just going to upset people and not lead to him being respected by his peers. But if they see that he is a genuinely bright, hardworking you know, child who's working his way through the ranks, then, then he, he could be a lot better off. Does it, um, do you ever deal with issues regarding what type of entity the business is? C Corp, S Corp, LLC, partnership, the dreaded partnership? <laughs> it, it's pretty rare that we see the sole proprietors or the partnerships anymore. I would say normally we're going to see S Corps, LLCs, or C Corps. Um, C Corps are a problem, right? I mean, just if you didn't change from a C Corp in '86, somebody was asleep at the switch. All right, you need uh, you probably need to explain that to our listeners. Um, so a C corporation would have its own corporate tax rate, and then when you take money out, you're going to pay your personal taxes. And you can minimize the what's called double taxation during your ownership by essentially distributing all the profits out. An S-Corp or an LLC or what 
known as what's called a flow-through entity, where there is no separate tax rate for the entity. All the income flows through to the owner. Um, when you go to sell your business, it is much more tax efficient to be a flow-through entity or be an S corp or LLC. Can you change? You can, and Gina may know, but the, the timelines and statutes always, uh, you know, get updated. But you can definitely change from a C to an S, and vice versa. Right, and we would certainly get one of our tax partners involved in um, advising on that point. Is that something you would normally do before you'd sell a business? So if you happen to be in one of those old C-Corps? It's one of the first questions we ask, what type of corporate entity are you? And if it's a C-Corporation, um, we are going to have that discussion. If they are late stage and we're going to market, we just kind of have to deal with it. The best way you deal with it is you, you more or less tell the buyers that they have to acquire the stock of the target corporation as opposed to the assets, because in most cases that will eliminate or greatly reduce the dual taxation. Buyers want to buy assets. Sellers want to sell stock. So Explain why. So from a tax standpoint and a liability standpoint, Craig, so from a tax standpoint, if they purchase the assets of the corporation, they're going to get to revalue those assets to fair market value, thus be able to redepreciate those assets over time. If they acquire the stock, it all goes to goodwill, and so they don't. it's not nearly as efficient tax-wise for the buyer. From a liability standpoint, if you say, okay, I'm only buying certain assets of this business, I don't get all the boogeymen, all the skeletons in the closet when I buy the stock. When you buy the stock, you bought the entire history of that company. So yeah. from a seller's viewpoint, almost whether it's an S-corp or a C-corp, it sounds like it's better to try to sell the stock. You would really like to sell the stock if you can, yes. And all, and all the unknown hidden liabilities, uh, they go along with the stock. If you sell the stock, yes. I mean, the, the purchase agreement on a stock sale is going to be probably two times longer because there are going to be a lot more what are called representations and warranties and indemnifications trying to make the buyer comfortable that they're not buying just a huge a huge bag of unknown risk. The due diligence. Correct. Right. It's, Which it's, brings up another risk <laughs> of selling a business, and that is any litigation. So when we talk about preparing your business for sale, you really want to get any of that litigation resolved, any liabilities that uh, might be outstanding that you've been disputing, things like that. That's another way to clean things up. What, what are some other cleanup areas? I, I, I kind of put in my own little notes that sometimes – Bis family businesses don't have, for example, real operating agreements or bylaws that actually work. Um, their internal controls for accounting are, let's just say, you can't really use the word controls. Um, what other kinds of things that, that would be cleaning up other than kind of the books and records? Well, as far as transferring the business, um, it's very important to have those operating agreements in place. Those operating agreements actually help support the discounts for lack of control and lack of marketability. For instance, if there's an agreement that says that you're unable to transfer shares outside of the family or only to permitted transferees, then that really helps support that discount that we would be able to take for your tax compliance purposes. Um, hmm. What about tax credits? Are there tax credits available for any kind of sale or any other tax issues that would apply? Uh, once in a while, we would see that. I would say it's it's really not a big factor when we're looking at the value or the sale of the business. Okay, I'm going to switch subjects a little bit, and we have closely held businesses, but I'm going to pretend there's this really successful fiduciary litigation firm by the name of Gasowitz Frankel or a firm like that. I see a lot of clients that aren't really one family owning it, but two. What are the differences when you're dealing with a closely held business? where you often have two or maybe three founders or primary owners. Do the, do the, do the issues change or the challenges different? Yeah, I think there's just more chance for a dispute, right? The more people that are in the mix, the more chance there are for, is for dispute, um, especially if some of those family members don't work in the business, right? They want to look at it like a cash register. It's like, okay, what's my distribution going to be this year? How much cash can I get out of the business? And then those that are running the business are like, well, we're not going to distribute very much. We need to buy some new trucks this year. We need to do some other things. And so you have potentially very uh, diametrically opposed you know, goals as to what the business is there for. Is the family there for the business or is the business there for the family? Well, a lot of businesses, family businesses, use it as a personal piggy bank in a way. They run all their, all their expenses through it. Their vacation homes, their golf club memberships, and, you know, the business, the cars, 
Um, that, I assume, is something that has to be cleaned up if you're selling, right? You're referencing what we call very technically an ad back, right? So when we get down to the bottom line and we say, okay, Gene has done this great valuation, but that's based upon the books and records. And then we come in, it's like, okay, if we have country club dues and we have hunting leases and we have boats and trains and planes and automobiles, it's like we need to add those things back and the the shorter the list of the ad backs that have to be verified by the buyer, the better, right? If the entire family is living out of the business and we have to go get shoebox fulls of Amex receipts um, to verify earnings, it's an issue, right? You're just going to create discomfort with the buyer. Although when you talk about an ad back, it actually increases the value of the business. If on paper it looks like it's generating a profit of X, but in reality they're using the business to Fil to filter certain expenses, those kind of go back to the X. They add on. Yeah, absolutely. So you can increase the earnings, thus increasing the value. But the question becomes, you know, how big of a percentage of the total earnings are in addbacks? If it's a smaller amount, then the buyer is going to be comfortable. They can diligence that. If it ends up being half the earnings is going off into 17 different directions, it's going to raise a lot of issues. What issues does it raise as long as they're verifiable? Um, you know, part of it becomes, okay, these are the ad backs they're telling us about. <laughs> Maybe there's a bunch of stuff they're not telling us about. It just comes down to kind of character and, and, you know, do we want to get Comfort level. But comfort the, level, character. But the owner, the owner who wants to sell would have an incentive to tell you all that because they want all that added back in to increase the value. I mean, they've made it look One like would the cash think. flow. Well, but they've made it look like the cash flow is artificially low. I could low. tell you about a car dealer I would work with, but, yeah. Okay. <laughs> car dealers are a whole separate issue. <laughs> we love car dealers. We had one in particular that, you know, just we went through the ad back list and we got very uncomfortable. We said, okay, 80% of what we're talking about here is fine. The other 20%, we're just going to pretend we didn't have that conversation conversation because buyers will not be interested in, in some of those things, right? It just, again, it comes down to, are you running the business professionally? Everybody understands some level of ad backs, but if it becomes egregious, it's going to raise But, but there should be an incentive on, on the part of the business owner who wants to sell to tell you everything that is flowing out into their pockets because that is going to lower the value. That's going to lower the amount of cash flow, the cash that flows to the bottom line, which is what a, a buyer is going to look at. How much, how much money do I actually get at the end of the day, if I'm running this business instead of the person I'm buying it from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, of course, then if you're transferring the business and you'd rather have that lower value, sometimes that, you know, we have to get in and determine what those are. They, the business owner may not be as forthcoming. Well, sometimes they want to stay buried if they're transferring it to a family member. Certain, but, but. Certainly. So, but we would go in and normalize those. So take out the personal expenses, try to normalize what a salary for that particular role would be. Normalize means what? To make it more normal. So <laughs> more, more honest. <laughs> what, what is more, normal? More, more market. <laughs> so if dad's coming into the business, you know, he's transferring it to his son or daughter, but he's he's only coming in one day a week to sign some checks, maybe an hour, but he's still drawing a salary of you know quarter million. That may not be normal. <laughs> So we would try to understand the roles of each of the family members and then determine what would be in a more normal salary range. What a shift focus a little bit. So I often see businesses that have to kind of stick around in their current structure on a transfer to another family member for tax purposes to wait and get the, the, the tax clearance letter, which for our listeners means generally you got to wait two years before you can change anything uh, to make sure your tax planning works. Um, but I see a lot of businesses struggle during that two-year period. They'll have a key person who, you know, you'll have a, I, I promise, stay around a year, but they don't really, or you don't want them to stay around a year, or they interfere, or they really don't want to transition the business. What can, can sellers do? What can you do as advisors to help make kind of the first two years of transition to another family member work? I'd say a lot of times if we have you know, in a third party sale, which is mostly what we're doing, again, it's about incentivizing those folks to say, I talked about some type of stock appreciation, right? Um, oftentimes we'll say, you know, part of that could and should be paid at the closing as kind of a thank you for getting us across the finish line. But part of that can be deferred for, and again, if it's non-qualified, it, it can be deferred two years, three years. So in other words, if you stick around for two <clears throat> years and help us do this, if it works, here's what you get. Exactly. It's, it's known as a stable 
bonus. Hey, we'd really like you to stay with the business for 12 months, 24 months. Oftentimes, post-closing, even some of the consideration for the seller is held um, in case there's a breach of the contract. Perhaps there's an earnout, which means there's more money available if the company continues to perform. So you might say, hey, I'm going to be sticking around as a seller for some period of time because I've still got some chips at risk, and I want you to stick around, help transition. And if you do that and we're successful, then you can have some mon monetary uh, reward. So a lot, a lot of this goes to how you structure the sale, whether you're getting cash at closing, whether part of the uh, purchase price is really going to be uh, shifted over to a consulting agreement as opposed to all purchase of stock or assets. Correct. Are, are there other issues related to how you would structure the, uh, uh, the, the actual payment of the purchase price? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'd say for the last 15 years, we've been doing almost exclusively cash-oriented deals. It seemed like back in the early 2000s, there were a lot of stock transactions. Um, I would say that the vast, vast majority of privately held businesses today are selling for primarily cash consideration. But even in a quote-unquote all-cash deal, you're not going to get 100% of your money on the day of closing. You may get 85, you may get 90%. And again, there'll be some type of holdback or escrow to ensure the buyer that the business is going to maintain that you haven't breached any representations or warranties in the contract, um, but mostly cash consideration. Okay. Let me ask you one other thing. Uh, are there specific situations you see where people come to you thinking they want to transfer the business to their to their children, uh, and, and you realize that this really ought to just be sold? I mean, does that come up occasionally? Uh, um, the the one client that comes to mind, he actually was going to transfer to his key employees, which I don't think we've really mentioned yet, but that is also one way to you know, liquidate your business. And we w did the valuation and work, work through it. It would be structured so where um, he would sell shares to the key employees, they take out a note, and then the distributions to the key employee would help pay down the note. But on paper, that was never going to work. Yeah. And so he did decide that you know, he's going to look for a third party. Right. Brian, do you ever see situations where someone wants to transfer to their son and after looking at it, you realize this is just not a good idea? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and sometimes it comes down to even if the son is in the business and doing a good job, dad still wants some cash, right? So if you're just going to think about gifting the entire business, well, then there's no money going to mom and dad. So yeah, oftentimes they realize, hey, this is literally a cashless transfer to the next generation. I'm going to move to Florida, and just in case Junior runs the business in the ground, I have no money. Um, that oftentimes will spark. Well, what if we did go to market? What kind of what kind of cash could I actually get off the table? Let me ask kind of an inverse question. So we really have been talking about valuation and sales from the seller's point of view. Let me just shift a little bit. Are you finding, Gina, that the buyer is using? oftentimes a very different valuation either for leverage for negotiations or because they really do view it differently? Well, I think the buyer is very sensitive to the risks and so I, I do think that they put more emphasis on risks so whether it um, and from a buyer's point of view I think that's why an earnout becomes such an important part of the deal or some sort of non-competition agreement <clears throat> so I do think that um, the buyer is just typically very risk averse. And, and if the buyer perceives risk, the buyer is going to pay less for the business. Absolutely. So, so let's be really blunt here. When you do your valuation for the seller, we know the buyer is going to come in with their own valuation. And if you, you're not getting your original valuation number on sale, we can pretty much agree on that, right? Well, that's right. When we're helping the seller understand the value of their business, we understand that that in the end is going to be negotiated. Okay, we are nearing the end of our show, and I warned you in advance, off, off record, so to speak, I was going to ask you a question about either your best or worst transaction. So, I'm going to give each of the, you the chance to do one of those, either the best or the worst, so our listeners can kind of hear the stories that would help or scare them, and because you're looking at me, Gene, I'm going to start with Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Head fake. Um, <laughs> Tons of stories after 20 years in the deal business. One that came to mind as we were talking about families, family transition issues, and, and valuation. Um, we had a family-owned business. Uh, this goes back about six or seven years ago. We had that two-family situation, Craig, as you talked about. And some of the folks were actively in the business 40, 50, 60 hours a week. The other ones weren't. Um, came time to sell. We had a contract with a public company to buy it for a lot of money. And as we led into the weekend prior to closing, a niece who had n probably never even seen the business or knew where it was decided she wasn't getting enough money. So she hired 
what I would call an ambulance chaser, and this guy came in, partnered up with her, and basically hijacked her aunt and uncle for seven figures over the weekend. Wow. So, so talk about family issues, valuation. Um, so happy know. ending, right? Is yeah. happy? You know, at the end of the day, what she was very happy. Um, and our client was actually still happy to sell the business, but it, it just goes to show without having some good family dialogue. I mean, really, there wasn't enough dialogue through the families as the process unfolded. The buyer even said, you guys should have your stuff together as you come to closing, meaning everybody should be on the same page. Uh, obviously, we weren't. Okay, well, communication is missing in, in every one of our cases. So <clears throat> not surprising here. Gina, good good or bad? Well, the ones that I remember best are the ones that had the, the happy outcome. Excellent. <laughs> so I do remember working for, um, we were valuing a home, a nurse home health care organization. Uh, mom had died. She was uh, the owner. Sister was involved in the business. Two brothers weren't. And they needed to understand the value of the business. They really thought that sister should have it, but there's an estate issue. And in the end, we were able to educate them, let them understand what the value is, what the impact would be. And it's just when they come back and say thank you, that really helped us. Okay, I, just, I, I want to underscore that you said the brothers wanted the sister to have it. Those are words I don't hear often. <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds like a more functional <laughs> two, two, different, two different stories, family. right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, before, before we close, let me get each of you to provide our listeners with uh, whatever contact information you have if anybody needs to uh, get a hold of you. Sure. Well, again, it's Gina Miller at Bennett Thrasher. My email address is Gina, that's G-I-N-A dot Miller at btcpa dot net. Right. right. And Brian Corbett at CCG Advisors. Our website is www.ccgadv.com. As we're wrapping up our show, I want to thank everyone for listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. For more information about Gaslowitz Frankel, please go to our website at gaslowitzfrankel.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute and use our show's hashtag Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Gina Miller, a consulting and advisory services director with Bennett Thrasher, LLP, and Brian Corbett, managing partner and we learned today founder of CCG Advisors. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. 